All right, welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast today. Dean, oh my gosh, I, I had it in my head and now I just completely, I literally just said it. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm messing it. There we go. There we go. It's not even that big of a tongue twister. Sorry about that. But well, wow, it's great to have you on, obviously from the UFCPI in Shanghai. Do you want to maybe give a brief background about yourself and we'll dive into some of the details? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, my name is Dean Amsinger. I'm the uh, technical director at the UFC Performance Institute uh, in, in Shanghai. Um, I uh, had a career in uh, mixed martial arts myself, um, fought internationally, was on the ultimate fighter and so on. Uh, but then, um, you know, even when I was, even when I was uh, fighting, I was coaching and sort of uh, had more of, a, more of an aptitude for coaching and moved that direction quite early, actually. Um, at like th 30, I, kind of, I stopped. I think 30, I stopped fighting, yeah. And then um, and then I moved m more into coaching and I was with Team Roughhouse with uh, like Dan Hardy and Paul Daly, Ross Pearson and, and those guys. Um, and um, but then alongside um, alongside what I was doing in um, MMA, I was also working in uh, as a strength and conditioning coach. Because uh, as you know, in MMA in the early stages, it wasn't <laughs> necessarily uh, lucrative of uh, <laughs> industries to work in uh, so um, that, that was and but it also sort of uh, prepped me for this job really in terms of my uh, view of bringing non-technical and technical training nice. together and sort of uh, a more um, uh, I don't want to use the word holistic but I guess more integrated yeah. uh, approach to uh, MMA preparation um, and I, I would definitely say that a lot of my uh, philosophies about my approach to uh, co both coaching and um, programming and the integration of non-technical and technical training has come from my experience in rugby. Uh, oh, nice. there are a lot of, although it's, although it's a, it's a team sport, um, I feel like there are a lot of things that you can take from it and particularly some of the mentors that I've had uh, in, in, in rugby, it's been very helpful to my um, philosophy that I now have an approach to. Um, mixed martial awesome. Arts. Who are some of your mentors in rugby? Uh, so Ollie Richardson would be yeah. the, definitely the first one. And um, I did my internship on, underneath him, and nice. we've worked together multiple times, actually. Um, uh, uh, Reds uh, in oh, okay. uh, Kubota yeah. in Japan. Um, and then um, uh, Dean Benton, mm -hmm. who also w w I worked with England Rugby. Yeah. Um, and, and then um, Franz Ludica, who I worked with in um, Japan, who was the Bulls coach. He's a, he's a technical coach. Um, it was a head coach there in, in Kabosa, but he also worked with the Bulls and won the, you know, won the Super twice yeah. with the Bulls. And he, like, he really influenced my um, approach to having a, just like the way I session plan, the way I individualized my programming for, in, in terms of technical coaching, um, I had never even thought of that before I worked with him, really. It was it, because, you know, my, my experience of technical technical coaching for martial arts was just from, you know, the traditional martial arts that I've, that I've worked yeah. in. Um, and I and I'd never really thought about um, understanding the needs of, of a particular style, understanding the needs of the sport, and trying to meet those uh, technical needs and and uh, physiological needs as well, and then individualizing your um, coaching depending on what, what those um, particular needs are as styles. And when I, as I mentioned, I can I feel like there's uh, similarities to uh, rugby and and um, uh, MMA uh, in, in in union. Uh, there's there's very many different there's different positions and the demands of those positions are changed in terms of their technical need but also the physio physiological needs like the difference of a winger and a prop couldn't really be much more uh, much more different so the approach that you would do in terms of their SSC programming would be considerably different but then also the, the requirements for you know the difference between scrummaging and and the ball handling skills that you need is completely different so he but he had a, a system of each each position in rugby, what do they need to be able to do? What does he want out of that position? And he made sure that that, rug, that person that played that position knew what was expected of him in that position. Um, and even when I, I played rugby as well, um, and I, I'd never had that from a coach really. I just, you just kind of played the position and you didn't, yeah. but you, and it was never really, re, never really broken down to me in that way of like, as a flanker, this is what I'm expecting from you. Or as a center, this is the skills that you need to, to play the system that we're playing. So then that, made me look at um, mixed martial arts and uh, the, and I've broken down MMA into like 11 technical skill categories. And then those 11 technical skill categories I use as a, uh, in terms of um, a skill, skill assessment, like understanding what, what those different skill categories are. And then when you look at it, look at it, where their strength and weaknesses are across those 11 technical skill categories. So 
there are, there's a foundation across those um, 11, uh, there's those technical skill categories that all athletes need to have a foundation of, because if you don't, then you're going to have, you know, deficits when you fight a particular style, but then you're going to have strength and weaknesses within that. And that's what forms your style, whether you're more of a striker, whether you're more of a grappler, but in the modern day, you have to have that complete skill set across those uh, technical skill categories. But that came from working with Franz and his, and the way he broke down those different positions. And I was like, oh, we, we, should, we should probably do that in MMA as well. Yeah, nice. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Now, th this will be a good topic to go down to. Do you want to maybe give a couple of examples of some of those 11 categories? There may be maybe some examples of, as you mentioned, if someone's heavier on one side of those categories of skill sets, how the strength condition kind of changes between, I guess, different styles. Yeah. So the, the styles, um, or for, for starters, the, so the 11, uh, technical skill catches, they're, they're in the, uh, journal, uh, the second, um, PI mm -hmm. journal that we, we uh, there's a topic about it there in terms of, uh, I think athlete assessment is one of the earlier, uh, chapters, but it's like striking offense, striking defense, wrestling offense, wrestling defense, then fence, fence wrestling offense and defense. So you start breaking it down in, 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 in that way, all the areas that you see and you, you ultimately, um, you know, you could put fence wrestling as part of, um, just as part of wrestling. But the way I sort of see it is that there's striking, wrestling and grappling, which come from the foundation martial arts. So, um, you, you could, you could just do wrestling, boxing or kickboxing and jujitsu, and you would know those areas of MMA. Um, and then there's nothing different about striking, wrestling and well, there's, not too much different between those uh, and the foundation martial arts. Whereas fence wrestling is not in any other martial art. Uh, get ups in the way that you need to do get ups for um, uh, mixed martial arts are not in any other sport because the way you get up, you, the mentality behind getting up in jiu jitsu, for example, is not mm. it's not really in there. It's in fact penalised. And then wrestling, the way you get up, you, they're happy to give you back more, which is dangerous in um, MMA. So there's a good different, although there is those aspects in there, there is, it's unique to MMA. Um, and then ground and pound is obviously unique to MMA as well, but it's bringing in aspects of the foundation martial arts. So the, the reason I separated it that way is because I feel like that there is um, techniques or technical skill categories that are unique to MMA and have been developed since the, the inception of the sport. And then there are the, fa the, uh, the, the technical skill categories that are predominantly from the foundation um, martial arts. So, uh, when, when we're looking at a, um, uh, an athlete that comes in, we have some objective tests, uh, well, as close to objective tests as we, as we can have, uh, for grappling and wrestling and, and, um, and get ups on both ends of that fence wrestling and wrestling and then, and then offensive grappling and, and get ups. So we have an objective tests there. Um, the only ones we don't have like really objective tests is for striking and, um, uh, ground and pound because they're, you know, then you're having to get into sparring and it's like, <laughs> that's, it's, 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 that's, you don't, you don't want to be doing that as part of, yeah. part of an assessment. So it's more, it's more subjective in terms of their technical coaches and using coaches, eye, et cetera. Um, so when we, um, when we, when we do that and we have an ongoing uh, assessment of the athletes, like my approach to, um, uh, my coaching would be that in off camp, we focus predominantly focusing on their weaknesses and then in fight camp, predominantly focusing on their strengths. Um, so, but to your to your question about and how that impacts um, uh, their strength and conditioning, I don't think the style necessarily it, it impacts it too much. Um, in in terms, of, it is more about that you know. The, I think you've had Gavon, mm. um, yeah. Gavin, yeah, yeah, and more about the profiling that we do, both in terms of the ESD profiling and seeing where their um, energy systems are, and if there are any deficits across the different energy systems or on the strength power profile and seeing if there's deficits there and what their strength, um, um, the force velocity curve looks like and wh whether it, in terms of their phenomen phenomenology and whether they're, you know, a force dominant or speed uh, dominant. So the, the, the style doesn't necessarily, the style will probably impact what that profile looks like, but it, but it, it doesn't necessarily. And so then we'll try to uh, balance it out in, in, in terms of their deficits, but it, it, it's not, it's not like the, um, just because they have a particular mm. style, we can have a, a particular approach. Do, does that yep. make sense? That makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, so in terms of what, in what we have in the academy program on the technical side, we have in the mornings at uh, the morning sessions we have where, where it's the full squad together um we we uh, I, I work in normally three week cycles moderate high low um and they, like and they cycle between um if they're not in fight camp off camp um general prep and specific prep and there'll normally be a six week 
um, uh, like we, I call it, uh, it, it intercoordination of technical streams. So there's there's coordination between those six weeks of, of when I'm programming those technical um, those technical sessions. So those morning sessions uh, will across the three across a three week cycle will hit all eleven technical skill categories within a week. I try to hit at least eight, and then that, that and that's covering the foundation of no matter what fighting style you are, you need to have that fundamentals mm -hmm. which I which I spoke to earlier. Afternoon sessions, which are split sessions between S and C and and technical training, then they go off into, um, they're bucketed by that skill assessment that I mentioned previously. And if someone, you know, a, we, a group of people need to be working on, say, uh, takedown defense, there'll be like four or five guys that will go off and do that. And be, that, that's, that's what they'll do. And then there might be some guys that need to be working on their head movement or wh whatever it might be. Uh, but we, and we have, we, um, we have a tiered system in the academy. So there's tier A, tier B, tier C. And so when we're, uh, bucketing and choosing um, in, in terms of athlete to coach ratio and how much resources we have. We don't, we don't have you know, an unlimited amount of coaches. We can't individualize that, absolutely individualize to every athlete. It's not possible. So we prioritize to um, the tier A's and then we work backwards from there if we can accommodate the, uh, accommodate the others. But they're still, they're still benefiting from what they're going to be yeah. uh, working on. It's just not quite necessarily as individualized as, as I would um, as I would hope for. But again, following that model of in off camp there, um, working on their predominantly, I'm not saying completely, predominantly working on their um, weaknesses and then fight camp working on their, um, working on their strengths. And for getting back to the podcast, I want to let you know there's a link down in the description for the Sweet Sounds of Fighting underground community. You can get all the help you need for your combat sports training. You get every single Sweet Sounds of Fighting training program, online course, and you get access to a range of coaches within the private Discord community. So go check that out and back to the podcast. That's because you mentioned this is, this is the academy squad. So they all come in together and train at the same time. And you take care of kind of the technical and the SNC scheduling, do you, with that entire squad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with so I'm assuming that you have guys that are uh, out of the academy that are full-time in the UFC. I'm assuming you don't have that same control in, in that aspect and they kind of have their own technical stuff that you have to work around? Yeah. So the, the academy guys, uh, I, yeah, I control uh, – I, I do all the programming and the periodization, obviously within with with uh, within the team as well. I'm not just mm. like uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but we, we obviously have to, we, we have, for starters we have um, you know daily morning uh, daily meet, morning meetings about what's going on in, in that day, but then a weekly um, longer meeting that we talk about the programming because don't. Also, one thing we have to consider, we have multiple different phases of camp operating at the same time uh, because there's different fight dates of people coming mm. up. So you may have you may have two people fighting in six weeks. You might have three people fighting in two weeks. You might have, and then and then the predominant of the group in off camp, but they might be in different phases of off camp because, you know, they had a fight not so long ago and then one one group are in return to play, one group, do you know what I mean? So yeah. they're, they're, I'm, I'm, bal I'm balancing all those different phases of camp. Um at the same time, so I, I operate the master timetable, and then we just get aligned with so that making sure that um, the NTT periodization is the same as the uh, technical um, periodization. That, that that's obviously really important that we have that con concurrent periodization uh, according to what phase of um, according to what phase of camp they're in. And then, you know, over the past few years, um, you know, we, we've been dealing with COVID. Right? Yeah, so, you guys have had uh, massive lockdowns, eh? Yeah. We've, <laughs> I, I, I don't even really want to get into it, but it's been an absolute nightmare. Um, and I did actually an, an analysis recently about some of the impact that we had because of that. And we've been shut over 30% of the time in the past four years since we've opened up, um, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and um, yeah, so, so, so now that we're open, the border is opened on January 9th, which is, you know, a massive relief to us and what we're planning to do with the, with, with the PI. Um, you know, now that, because although the academy initially was based on um, uh, the uh, Chinese athletes and developing Chinese MMA, it's actually for the whole of Asia. Um, and so Kevin Chang is the SVP of the APAC region for the UFC. Like he's, you know, he's trying to develop uh, MMA in the whole of China, uh, sorry, whole of Asia. It just so happened that when we first got there and it made sense to just focus on China, we're in China yeah. and then we'll open up the academy to other Asian countries. And 
right now, actually, we're having the Road to UFC uh, final, which is why I'm in Vegas right now, um, which is uh, which has been, I don't know if you've been following it, but it's been a tournament across all of Asia, four eight-man um, tournaments. And we have representation from India, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Thailand, Japan, Korea, and, and obviously China. Um, and in the final, there's actually an Indo Indonesian and an Indian, which is like, fun, you know, fantastic. We thought we'd potentially, you know, maybe dominated by Japan and Korea and, um, and China, but we've got two guys in the final from India and Indonesia. Um, and it's really to, um, yeah, highlight the talent coming out of Asia. But we, as a PI, uh, we are supposed to be servicing all of those countries, mm. and, including APAC. Australia and New Zealand, having, you know, guys, guys from City Kickboxing coming over, or it was supposed to be for everyone so they can use as a resource so they don't have to go to America. Um, but we haven't been able to do that. But then, the, but then the Chinese, because of the restrictions, up until January 9th, you still had to do a two week um, quarantine oh, yeah. to, to uh, <laughs> China. And, at one, and at, at one point, it was a, well, at one point, it was the 21 day quarantine. Oh my um, gosh. And I've, I've, in the past, yeah, in the past in the past three years, I've done fifteen weeks of quarantine. Holy shit, man! From coming in, and, from coming in and out of China. Anyway, so so anyway, so the Chinese athletes that have that either were already in the UFC or have graduated from the academy into the UFC, which mm. is obviously the main thing we're trying to do. Um, when they're in China, that if they when they're and they they will use the PI, um, and often they'll just integrate into. Our, our timetable and and oh, train right. with, with us particularly yeah particularly with um uh, you know, like for example like sumu uh sumu is coming back from an injury and he's using you know he's doing his recovery and rehab uh with us and it's, and it's good because because we do have an interdisciplinary um team you know the the, the um PT and SSC are aligned in terms of their programming for his um on his recovery and then and then also the PT can work with myself and we we can um tailor his uh, technical training for the, with the limitations they, that might be put on him because of the uh, injury. So he can still get back to the mat as soon as possible. And because we're having, you know, those daily meetings about his progress and whatnot, we can, you know, stop get him on the mat as soon as possible, rather than sometimes when, when you're working with a um, PT, they kind of like keep, keep you away from it until mm. they've, they've, you've hit a particular yeah. milestone. Whereas we want to be in, yeah. back on the mat as soon as possible, but working within the limit limitations of, of a, a particular injury. Um, and then, but, but having said that, um, there is a limit because I work for the UFC and the technical coaches work for the UFC. Uh, we can't work individually with the UFC fighters. Hmm. So, okay. um, they, yeah. can, they can come, they can come into the squad sessions and they can get involved in that. Any UFC fighter can do that. Uh, but I can't, I won't hold pads for them. I won't, um, do any, um, like individual sort of, uh, game planning or anything like that, because then you're getting into like a bit of a sort of, um, conflict of interest really yeah. uh, to yeah to do that so uh, th that's the only sort of rules around the UFC guys that work there and, and and we're hoping now that the border is open that we're you know going to have a lot of more a lot more um UFC guys using the facility like I'm I'm friends with the guys at Bangtao and, and Woody the SSC coach there I know he wants to bring over um, some of his guys there and get some profiling done, some diagnostics done that we can then share with them that he can program off the back of that. And that's hopefully what we want to be as a resource uh, for all the, all, I mean, anywhere in the world, but it just <laughs> geographically yeah. and logistically, um, the, the fighters, any UFC fighter in the world can use the, the both PIs. Okay. Uh, but it just, I could imagine that, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll make more sense for the guys in Asia and um, the APAC region. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I want to ask you as well, with I guess with your background, with, with the technical side, um, along with, I guess, the integration, does that influence your how you program your conditioning at all? Are you looking at programming more specific style conditioning because you have that technical background, or are you looking just purely, hey, like we need to reach you know these outputs, et cetera, et cetera? Um, yeah. So in in off camp, um, I we, we we're looking at the ESD profiling in terms of what their um, what particular deficits there may be, and we, we we've. We've now put together like a, a um, an assault bike a VO2 max test, um, an assault bike MAP and MGP test, and uh, we're getting some decent normative data from the the UFC uh, roster of of where the standards are for for the weight classes across those those different tests. So then, once you get that, when you when you create those standards, once you do that testing, you can see you can compare and see where particular deficits might be on, on that. So I feel like off camp is the perfect time for you to do that. And you want to be, st for me, fight camp is not about 
you know, getting really, really fit and, and <laughs> like, and, and you, it's, that's getting the, off the, the couch should be, and then starting to train. No, yeah, <laughs> no, we, we, we talk about a 52 week fight camp and it's obviously a little bit tongue in cheek, but it, it's about, you know, it's not about those huge peaks and troughs of detraining and taking huge amounts of time off, off camp is you, you want to be building on uh, where you've been before each, each off camp. So, and like I, I, not on just on a technical side, but on a f physiological side, working on those deficits. So hopefully they're starting a fight camp in a good in a good um, point to then to then really uh, peak for the fight. And so I, I'd like the guys to get uh, fit from the sport during fight camp, and then off camp we're leaning on more targeted um, ESD development and based on those um, those diagnostics that I, that, that, I, that I talked about and Gav, Gav and Roman and, and the guys here put together some really good uh, prescriptions uh, to work on those deficits when we, once they do come off nice. uh, off that testing uh, and it's, it's so far we've, it's been you know it's constantly ongoing that's what's so exciting about working for the uh, performance institute we're like we're constantly um, trying to review and, and improve and we're getting more data from from um, the guys that we're testing as they as they come through the uh, the PI and we're, the, the data is becoming more robust uh, because the, the more people are using it and we're developing the test off the back of it. Like yesterday, Roman was doing a um, uh, doing a sled test, but with a gas analysis mm -hmm. uh, doing and he's, he's doing some, yeah. Roman's doing some really. I don't know if you've had Roman on. No, I um, haven't to talk. But, uh, you, de you definitely yeah. should. He's doing some really innovative stuff uh, with, with particularly on the ESD side, and so. Um, yeah, so if that, that in off camp, if that's the focus, and then we get them to a to that point, um, and then when they start fight camp, I do like a, I like a, a Shark Tank type style uh, conditioning for um, which in integrates um, like an in uh, one person doing it with like two fresh people, and then we put them in situation based on their game plan, mm -hmm. and there's some pre fatigue as well, like a salt bike with a pad work, and it's it's over effectively a higher intensity. Um, a training than you that you would find um, in in a, compared to a fight pace, uh, and then what I'm looking for in terms of markers there is they're like one minute recovery post the um, uh, uh, one minute post of the three rounds, and you know we're looking at hopefully getting them over 20 20 percent uh, re recovery. And like one of the guys that just fought about to fight recently, he'd like managed to get over 30 percent recovery. Yeah, um, yeah and, it, and it's, it's, which is pretty pretty impressive, particularly. Because it's not like a VO2 max test, um, where it's more centralized fatigue. But when you're grappling and the, 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 all that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with wrestling and, stuff, and, the, and all the peripheral fatigue, to be able to get your heart rate down like that um, after three rounds of high intensity training is, is pretty impressive. And although, um, and, and so because in that off camp, we can have that more targeted um, ESD development because. Uh, when they're training and um, you're, you're doing, you're, you know, if you're trying to just get fit from the sport. Uh, because there's different styles, you may not be getting uh, the, the different hits or the, yeah. of the different energy systems depending on different styles. So, in, in fight camp, um, if, they, if, if you've done that work prior to that, then hopefully they're in a point that I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it's improved their any particular deficits across it. But then in fight camp, the the um, the, there's a conditioning element, obviously, to that uh, shark tank, but it's also the psychological uh, part that I'm looking for in terms of how do they how do they react in tough situations? How do they react when they're tired? How, what's their decision like making like when they're tired? Uh, because you don't want that all sparring to be like that, and, mm. and because sparring, you know, sparring is also about uh, controlling the pace and the rhythm that you want to have in that. So if you if you're trying to get conditioning out of sparring, um, then you're losing some of the technical aspects or tactical aspects that you might. What, by having a higher intensity yeah. shark tank, of, of sparring. whereas using the, the shark tank for the, the, the conditioning, I've got the psychological aspect, the physiological aspect as well. Um, and I'm, I'm ticking the boxes that I want in terms of um, uh, preparedness, uh, preparedness markers for, for competition. And so that's kind of the, the, the approach that we use at, um, at the academy in terms of yeah, integrating uh, conditioning. That's awesome. Uh, I'm, uh, there might be some people listening to this that don't, for example, may not have the ability to maybe do shark tanks and stuff like that, maybe for whatever reason, um, as an amateur, do you have maybe any advice or recommendations for someone? Okay. What can they do, uh, for that higher intensity conditioning, maybe during, maybe when they're preparing for a fight? Um, I mean, the thing is about the shark tank though, is that it's the least, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, there's not a lot of equipment you need yeah. for it. So <laughs> if you have a two training partners, 
Uh, and even if you didn't have an, an assault bike, there's other, there are other pre fatigues that you could use, like bodyweight exercises, mm. like sprawls or, uh, you know, burpees, yeah. some sort of pre fatigue that, and then going into the, uh, the technical areas. Um, and I, 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 I chain across the, across the six, we normally have a six week fight camp and across the six weeks, we change other, other factors like on the pad work. We start with just boxing and then it moves to uh, kickboxing and then it moves to, uh, like uh, MMA pads. Uh, on the on the rest time, we start at a minute ten, and by the end of the minute, we we end at fifty seconds. Um, in terms of the positions on the on on the um, that they're working on, like the the starting positions of grappling and, and um, wrestling, uh, we start with positive positions, and we get and uh, across mm, the three rounds, nice. and there's and then we start getting more negative positions, and so across the three rounds. Um, there's no, we normally get three to four because the the timing of the grappling is from between. Or grappling or wrestling is between 15 and 45 seconds and it's depending on what happens in that particular grappling exchange and i'll make the call in there so this so it, it recreates the randomness of um of a fight so it's not like oh, 30 seconds of this gotcha. 30 seconds of that it's, it's random it's random every time um and but so we normally get three to four technical um grappling or, or or wrestling positions in per round and then and then i'll it changes across the weeks about how many of them are positive and how many of them are negative and they, and they progressively get nice Tougher and <laughs> yeah, more that sounds like it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's good. I, I've, that's that's come over a lot of time of work. It started out a lot more simple. And it was just like getting there, and, but now I've tried to yeah, again applying some sort of um, SSC programming philosophy to to the uh, to the Shark Tank to make it a, a little bit more um, yes for what I'm, what I'm wanting out of the yeah. athlete. Yeah, for sure. I like that. The, you also mentioned obviously you you program over like a three-week cycle like medium high low for someone listening who's maybe yeah. planning their own training and training weeks what are you manipulating within those within those weeks to make it moderate high and low okay so uh what so what we do is th and this is part of um how we get different phases of uh camp operating on the mats at the same time so uh, on on certain sessions, we'll do uh, look, on a, on a Monday Thursday. We have a wrestling Monday uh, morning and a, an offense wrestling on a Thursday morning. And what I like to do is uh, like ten uh, up to ten minutes of drilling on a particular uh, technique, and then we'll go into live of that t technique. And I, I kind of I, I like to prescribe to um, my coaching is definitely impacted, sort of influenced by the constraints led approach. Yeah. And so manipulating the constraints in those live situations um, to, to uh, test what we've been working prior to that. And so in those live rounds, we can either have three live rounds or one live round. And they, so if everyone's on the mat, if someone's in fight camp, they're doing three live rounds. And if you were in um, off camp, you'd only be doing um, off general break, you'd be, or return to play, you'd only be doing one. And if you're in specific break, you'd be doing, you'd be doing two. Uh, and then, and so if you, if you weren't doing the, if you were in off camp, you would carry on drilling and then you, you join in in the last, last round. And you, you know, so everyone on the same gotcha. match can have a different level, different mm -hmm. ratio of live drilling, which so ultimately is the biggest thing that impacts, um, the, in, in the intensity of that, of that session is the live to drilling ratio. So there's that aspect and then there's total number of rounds as well uh, so there's certain sessions that don't have that structure that have more of their they're doing tactical work uh, earlier or technical work earlier and then we finish with a block of live work but then, and, and then still that's that the number of rounds they do in that live work again impacts that ratio of live to drilling um, and then on a on a deload week uh, that that live amount of rounds are considerably pulled back and there's also one less session as well so there's a extra um extra half day so that that in terms of the training load of that week that then is uh, significantly reduced and sometimes depending on what phase they're in for example on their snc they don't have any sd they're just doing strength training so the gotcha. duration of the session is reduced gotcha. yeah so so and, and our, our we we measure rps uh, srp of um of all of our sessions and our training load and, and then obviously monitor the uh, the duration of the session so that we um, have, have the training load and like pretty closely it the um uh periodization the coaches plan periodization across weeks and across in and and by individual sessions um mirror the uh what we get out of the athletes in terms of the uh, that their data so it's, it's it's been working pretty well so far because um you know yeah there's a pretty strong correlation between um like yeah live to drilling ratio and the intensity of that session gotcha nice how's how different is 
I guess, working with these athletes in Asia compared to maybe the ones that are coming through in the States? Have you, I don't know if it, if you've had much experience on both sides or, or kind of like the different countries, but I'm assuming because, because the PI is relatively new in Asia compared to, compared to the one in Vegas. So do you have, yeah. are there any like big differences that you've noticed between the athletes in terms of maybe, I don't know, maybe the ones in Asia have a more well-trained or less well-trained versus the ones that come in um, to the ones in the States? Do you mean, what, what do you um, mean by well-trained uh, though? Just more like, uh, I guess you could say have a better physical underpinning already coming in or that more bigger training age coming in. If yes or no. Oh, training. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that depends on um, what system the guys have come from. And I, we haven't, and this will be my um, subjective opinion. Mm -hmm. We haven't actually specifically looked at that, but um, you know, the same thing would be in America. Like the guys that have come out of wrestling through collegiate programs um, that have had that structured training, those guys are, are, are obviously more well-trained. And some of the guys that come from traditional martial arts that haven't had that. Yeah. Um, on, on, on average, probably not. And that, that would be the same for the guys in China. We have some guys that have come out of wrestling programs, of, of either national wrestling program or um, provincial. Uh, and the same for, and Sander is actually a national sport for them because in, in, I think it's in the Asian Games. So they have like training schools at young, at young age for Sander. And a few are guys who either come through that or they've come through wrestling. So they're, they're, they're decently well, well trained in that sense. Uh, what they've done in that training is it hasn't necessarily <laughs> been. Um, <laughs> the, the best, but they've done a lot of it. They do a lot of volume. It's like kind of like um, sort of yeah, Russian style, yeah. like old school, yeah. like get the reps in, get the you know sets in. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, but but they've um, they're very coachable in that sense, and um, they're, yeah, no, they're, they're pretty for the most part pretty pretty well trained. Gotcha. <clears throat> is there an academy system in uh, in the states like there is for the Asian PI? No, no, okay. no there's not. No. No, because, you know, the, the whole – we're opening Mexico next, and there will be there and mm, will okay. be in Mexico. Um, but the, in, in America, it didn't need the academy model because, you know, the infrastructure of MMA in um, – US, in the US is the most developed of anywhere in the world. Like they, they have the technical coaches, they have the knowledge, they have the understanding of the sport. Um, you know, there's so many great, even in Vegas, there's, you know, Extreme Couture, the Syndicate and, and all the guys that come through from the, the rest of America. Um, the reason we have the academy in, in, in China, because it is a little bit further behind, um, the, you know, the, the, particularly in the way that they, the individual martial arts are pretty, pretty good. Um, but, the, but think of November May as a sport, as a, in, as a martial art in itself and integrating the transitions between the different, um, um, technical skill categories, I, I guess, uh, isn't as, as, as advanced or is it as, um, just in terms of numbers as well. Like I did a bit of analysis of like where, where the, um, where the sport is in terms of numbers and it's not, it's, it's still not that, uh, big yeah you can, you can get that from topology because you can see active fighters um you know in all the different weight weight classes and it's com comparable size to like the uk i think it's actually smaller than the uk for example in in, in china so um but try, M mma and in the uk has been more developed for a longer period of time and there's you know we've had there's there's been no there's only been one coach in china that have, has had a career and then come back into coaching whereas whereas in england my generation are now coaching, like Dan Hardy's coaching now, yeah. Jimmy Wall, I well, know Jimmy Wall's yeah. fighting, but he's also coaching. We've got that. And then that, that, that brings in another generation, whereas China's still in the stage of like the first generation of fighters gotcha. coming through. They haven't, gotcha. quite got, haven't quite got to that stage of, of, um, uh, of becoming coaches. So, um, yeah, it's a little, a little bit behind. And so we, we're only going to be going into market, into markets or territories with academies that need the help mm. of developing mm. the, the, um, the sport in that in that particular place. Did you know you can represent Sweet Arts of Fighting while you're training? We're more than just a membership. We also have rash guards and shorts. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that we have the Sweet Arts of Fighting 2.0 shorts. And we also have the Sweet Arts of Fighting short and long sleeve rash guard. There is another design coming soon, but you can get those on xmarshall.com and you can go down the description and you can find that. And back to the podcast. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. I wanted to jump a little bit into the gym itself. I know people are always wanting to know exercises, even though, you know, we know that's not <laughs> that important in the grand scheme of things, but are there any exercises that you're very fond of for MMA fighters that you kind of like to keep in the rotation? Um, 
I mean, a med ball <laughs> is, um, is, you know, use, use a med ball particularly uh, for, you know, rotational power and some of the ballistic stuff that you can do with it. Uh, it's an oldie, but a, a goodie. And I think that um, it, it can be used it, it, when, when prescribed in the right way, it can be um, used very effectively. Um, we also have um, the, the, these uh, jammers that, that are part of the uh, squat rack, I'm sure you're familiar with. And um, we're getting some, the, if in terms of what it feels like, the, to the, the athlete, there's a lot of positive response for how, how they like to use it in terms of, um, you know, it, it isn't throwing a punch, but uh, more so than maybe um, the landmine punch throw, which is, all, we, we do like the landmine punch throw. Um, you know, in terms of like, if you're thinking of uh, like specifics that is related to um, potential transfer to uh, uh, the actual sport, then, the, then those three are definitely things that we've been, um, integrating at, at, at different times for sure. Yeah, nice. Uh, and I know you mentioned obviously with the sled testing as well. I know you guys. Well, I mean, I see it on Instagram a lot. A lot of a lot of prowler pushing with with um, different athletes. Do you have any? Are you able to share any kind of different protocols you guys like to use on on the prowler? Um, off the top of my head, I don't. I, I can't. I can't think um, of uh, what is the most. I mean, it, re it really, it really depends yeah. of what we're like. Yeah, it really depends of what. F there's so many. There's so it, that, as a modality, it can be used so many mm -hmm. uh, different ways. Uh, like we have, we also have a um, uh, like a non-technical shark tank uh, for guys that maybe have injuries mm, okay. that can't be doing um, uh, that can't be doing um, uh, like wrestling as part as part of it, so the the, the, the prowler uh, is, is is used in that. But there's so many there's so many different protocols that there, there's not like one that stands out to me that, that would uh, of any significance. That um, you know, that it's, it's, it's depend it's, it's situation dependent of what we're trying to develop in terms of an attribute. So yeah, it's sort of hard to say. I guess yeah. no, no yeah. problem. I'm asking some very some very general questions there. I know, but <laughs> the the ones that they always <laughs> come through too. So. I I asked them just so we can we can get them through to the, to the audience as well. But but outside of that, like, how does the training week look for you guys? I mean, we can use the academy as the example because, like, are they training that, that yeah. full time? Full time, yeah. yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. Let's have a look at yeah, that, that so, week. Yeah, so the, they they're on two a days: uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then um, uh, yeah, one a day: Wednesday, Saturday. Um, I don't know if I could probably, is this possible to share yeah, the screen? You can share if you just go share down the bottom and then that should. Oh, let me get some. Yeah. So if anyone's listening to this on Spotify and whatnot, you should watch it. Okay. All right. Got it. So, uh, yeah. So this is, this, this is a timetable for guys in, this was actually this, um, earlier this year, I guess. Yep. Um, so, uh, this is the normal sort of timetable that we look at, um, and as I mentioned, so the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday is full. Uh, the whole academy is uh, does it, also the sparring as well. Um, but the sparring, check, uh, we have different times. So sometimes we'll have um, off at, the, at this period. We didn't have there wasn't it was in the lead up to a, a Chinese New Year, so we didn't have that many guys in the academy. But when we're at full um, capacity, like with say thirty um, thirty guys there, then we'll have multiple starting times of uh, sparring, depending on what phase of camp you're in. Um, and so the, the, the foundation um, session or core sessions or core timetable, should I say, is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And then the afternoon sessions, which is here, here, here and here, um, are the swing sessions, which I mentioned about, which are individualized, uh, depending on what um, what you need to, need to be working gotcha. on. Gotcha, okay. uh, And so, yeah. And then, and so, and then each session, as I, as I mentioned, so the, we, is this still, is this yep, still sharing? Yep, still got it. Yeah. So as I mentioned on some of the sessions are, um, uh, they'll, we'll do a drill, then they'll go into some live work and then a, another drill into, in, into live work. And then the, how, whether they're in threes or two or in pairs or, um, any notes that come into related to the constraints can be put in here. Um, then this, this here is, uh, um, modifications from sports medicine in terms of uh, like any 
adjustments that might be made for uh, injury of each, say there's particular sessions that they can't do um, and then we have a um, we have a hold on. Oh. I think it's decided to freeze on me. Oh, okay. classic. <laughs> there we go. Uh, there we go. Here are the different options. Yeah, the different options of um, modifications that we might have, whether it be a gradu graduated return to play from uh, concussion and the stages that they're at there, because we have like protocols for how they come back from that, um, or ESD in lieu of the live set, etc. There's other different options uh, that we can have there. So that as, as technical coaches, when we're on the mats, um, and we know that there might be some limitations as we talked about getting them back on the mat as soon as possible, but within the construct like limitations of a, of a, um, uh, of a particular injury. And so then that, that's what, when we have those morning meetings, that that's what this is updated from. They'll give us an update on what they're able gotcha. to do. Um, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll have, uh, yeah, the, the, these are the session plans for the, um, for the different, um, uh, like, yeah, technical sessions. And it's the same for, um, all of them, just so I can, just so I can monitor what we've been working on and in the, in the programming, et cetera. So, um, going back to, uh, uh, the actual timetable though, the color of the session also, um, sort of relates to the, uh, coaches planned, um, uh, RPE. It's not the actual uh, number, but it's, it covers a, yeah. basically a low, moderate, green being, green, green being low, um, orange being moderate, red being high. Uh, and then, and when it went, the, um, our sports science coordinator uh, will ask me what, what, after every session, what I, what was the RPE so that we also can compare, um, you know, with the coach's plan compared to the athletes and see if there's any anomalies from that or, you know, outliers and then, and then investigate why there might be that, that, um, uh, sort of, yeah, discrepancy, should I say. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically what the timetable looks like. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Wednesday and Saturday, there'll be different sparring start times, uh, dependent on what phase of camp there are. So if they're in fight camp, maybe they'd start later and we'd use some of those guys for fresh people in those rounds. Um, or it'd be starting earlier, depending on what uh, phase of camp they are. And then they also, this would switch rounds. So sometimes not... Generally, I can't remember off the top of my head why this was this, this way, but generally off camp, we have non-technical training first and um, technical training after. And in fight camp, we have technical training first and fight camp. Mm, that's okay. also so we can keep the, keep that, that's also so we can keep the athlete coach ratio nice and low. And we split them by phases in those afternoon sessions. So sometimes, we, you know, when you're working with like a group of four or something, and uh, again, uh, based on those, those um, sort of buckets that we, that we talked about. Nice. Do, do you ever have coaches that go rogue during those green sessions and pump the RPE? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> because, uh, because as you see, as you see from um, the session planning, we, we plan ahead before we know, we know what's going on in that session um, before, before it happens. No one's turning up to a session and just, and just coaching, um, which, which when I was, fighting that's what was happening <laughs> for sure and i didn't even i didn't like i said before i went into rugby i i entered on the rugby coaching side should i say i hadn't even thought about a session session plan and yeah beforehand planning what we were going to be working on or, or, or planning ahead weeks ahead of what we were going to be working on technically um so no we we, we we have a coach we have coaches meetings as well so we get aligned and i and we i also have a a technical theme of the week so if there's a technical theme so that uh, the double leg, everything in that week from a technical perspective will be in some way connected to the double leg. And that doesn't mean that it like absolutely has to, and it doesn't yeah. limit the freedom of the creativity of the coach, but it's just in keeping that in mind, even on, even on striking. And if you're having an awareness for double leg defense or if, or if you're striking into takedowns and you're looking for combinations that would go into that, or if you're in uh, uh, BJJ, what position do you normally land in from a double leg? And then, so there's like continuity between the sessions and connections between the sessions. And we often, and also for, in terms of like recall, um, like the warm up from um, a session on a Thursday will be the, the session that would be a review of the session on a Tuesday, for example. Yeah. So when, when they, when we program together, they let us know what we're doing and I'll put that as part of the warm up as one of my sessions or vice versa. And so there's integration and we, it's not just like, Oh, we've done something on a Monday and we don't come back to that for three weeks. We're getting, you know, touch points on it across the week and then across the three week cycle as well, because we all program together. Nice. Now it's funny you say that cause I've been part of teams where the coaches uh, don't have a plan. They turn up on the day and, 
professional sport, but you know, they do what they want. Yeah. And, and you're like, okay, it's supposed to be a lower day today, but That's they're like, just I mean, beasting them. A... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the, on the technical side, it, I think it's important as well. If you look at like, um, the research about skill acquisition and whatnot and, and how th things should be put together or, or, and, and particularly in terms of the recall, recall sessions, uh, later on, that's, that's super important, but, um, on the periodization side, it, it just, everything goes out of the window. If you're suddenly like, it's supposed to be a low and you're, and you're making these guy, guys spar. Um, you know, when, when, um, one of the challenges I faced and I think a lot of gyms would also face it nowadays is, uh, we have the luxury of everything is centralized. So mm. ev all their sessions are done in one gym and every c coach is in the same building and we're having daily meetings and weekly meetings about planning their training. Whereas when I was training, I was traveling an hour to go and do messenger over here. I was traveling an hour mm. to go and do my wrestling here. And then in one gym, I do my, do you know what I mean? And then those coaches might not have even known each other, let alone communicate. And so when I get to that coach, they're like, oh, you know, I want hundred percent from you to make sure you're working hard. But he hasn't thought about early, earlier in the day, I've, I've already, you know, sparred 10 rounds. Um, and he's thinking I'm being lazy, but you know, and I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, communication. So even if you are in that situation where you're not in a centralized uh, gym, having someone, even if it's, if it's yourself, communicate what you want in, in terms of the timetable and having alignment in terms of, even if it's like high, low, high, low, some sort of period, uh, some sort of periodization um, uh, 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 with, so that we're getting the most out of our training sessions and not everything's just like, <laughs> yeah, like medium, you know, is that ends up, everything ends up being medium. If you'd like, or oh, moderate, sorry. Um, if, if you don't have that periodization. So if that was one no, thing for, I would for sure say, do, do you, oh, it's an easy fix for, no, you're for a people. Yeah. I'm no, sorry. I gotcha. You, you just cut out a bit there. Um, do you, do you have a language barrier that you have to deal with there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, that is, that is one of the biggest challenges. Sorry. I'm, I'm just noticing my, um, it's, it, I'm here in Vegas and it's like super dry and my lips are like messed up. <laughs> and I see it on the camera. <laughs> it's really bad. It's like, it's so dry here. It's crazy. Like I get no nosebleeds for no reason. Cause it's like, super oh my dry gosh. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So the language barrier is, and I've been there for nearly um, four years now. Um, and so I've got a little bit of coaching Mandarin, um, just like the, the things that you, su that you surprise in terms of your vocabulary as a coach that you use so often, yeah. you know, start and stop and how long a round is, how many reps you want them to do, uh, think things like yeah. that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm capable to do and, 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 you know, mot motivating them when it's hard or, or get up or, and things, things like that, which it's actually a relatively limited vocabulary that you use. Uh, but anything beyond sort of commands, uh, I, I have to use a translator and I have a translator with me the whole time. Um, and it, it's challenging because, uh, not only they not only, even if he's a really good translator, right? It, it's, it's not just about translating. It's about interpretation. Yeah. Uh, because it, the, the direct translation for something doesn't mean the same thing sometimes. And he has to use his judgment in that moment to try and get across what I'm trying to say. When I'm talking about tactics, when I'm trying to talk about, um, uh, you know, the, the, the nuances of of, of fighting. And when you're talking about in metaphor and stuff, I've, I've, no, I've, I've realized not to talk in metaphor <laughs> because uh, th there are cultural metaphors that make sense. Right. And, and normally it's actually, you know, storytelling is a good way of, of, um, explaining what you're trying to say. But then when you're doing that through a translator, it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, and, but having said that, and because I worked in Japan, as I mentioned um, yeah. before, um, and that was really what got me onto kind of the constraints led approach of, um, of, of coaching, because I looked into, you know, how, how, how can I, um, sort of reduce the need for me to ex be explaining it. And if the outcome of a, of a drill is the, is the, what I'm trying to, um, teach then then that's, that's actually a better way of learning anyway yeah and so when when you manipulate the drill t around the constraints um of the task then uh you know you can you can get that without actually having to coach too much and it also it also made me realize that i probably overcoached uh, earlier in my career i wanted to like coming from a place of wanting to share the information uh, but in, in reality you need to give them the space to to work things out for themselves you know information is better uh, re retained when it's 
it's navigated on their own rather than being, being spoon fed. Um, so yes, there are definitely some um, challenges and limitations, but they're also, I feel like all of us uh, um, foreigners that are working over there, it's made us better coaches by having to, uh, yeah, n navigate that, um, that challenge. Um, and I think that one, one of the, one of the things as well is like, you know, like, uh, in terms of when they're building up to a fight and you're, you're getting that contact with the athlete of understanding where their confidence is at or where, what things you might need to say to them. And, you know, you speak to them before training, see where, see where they're at. And it's like, it, it, looking at their response to the training load and stuff, but that comes from like body language before the training and stuff. But it's also those small conversations that you have with them yeah. before and after training. And so missing that is, is, is tough because, uh, that that's an important part of, of, of coaching. And when you're doing that through a translator, mm. it's, it's just, it's just not the same. Yeah. No, I went through <laughs> um, the same thing when I was working in Romania, it's like, oh, most of them spoke English as well, but you know, the ones that don't and have to build that relationship is near impossible. Because you just can't speak the same language. So regardless of yeah. if you're translated there, it's you know it's just one of the things that yeah. can't be done. No, oh, I just my charger. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's um, but it's getting it's it, it's uh, like I said, I'm I'm learning. I'm trying. I'm doing my best to try and learn. And also, their English is starting to get better mm. because they're hearing us speak English more. Uh, and now, and they and they, you know they enjoy it when they say stuff, and we respond positively to it it's like a bit of banter when they can say um some you know english stuff and and some of the um guys who have um graduated uh to the ufc have spent time in america and did fight camps there and stuff and and then they've had to learn more english yeah. because they're you know they're you know no one no one's speaking chinese helping them <laughs> having the, uh, a translator um so yeah it, it's 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 an ongoing thing and and um it's not just yeah not just a language thing it's a cultural thing as well having a, mm. what motivates them what yeah what, what um yeah, drives them so. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, no, for sure. Another, another, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I think I've gone through everything I want to ask you, Dean. But if anyone wants to find you and follow what you're up to, where can they do that? Um, it's well, it's just my name on on all um, social media: Twitter, um, Instagram, and I don't I don't really use Facebook. But Twitter, <laughs> Instagram is just Dean Dean. Up. B A N A M A S I N G E R. Uh, and that, yeah, that's it. Perfect. I'll link those all up in the description for anyone listening and watching. But thanks for coming on and thanks for sharing as well the uh, the schedules you have there from, from the UFCPI in Shanghai. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on, mate. Yeah, cheers.